On behalf of the American Academy of Biological Dentistry and its board of directors and members, I'd like to welcome you to Carmel to our 17th annual seminar. Since its inception, this academy has had remarkable success in bringing world-class presenters uh, on the cutting edge of education, the cutting edge of tr treatment and practices uh, to this meeting. The fathers of energy medicine, Bohl, Turk, Cromer, Glidish, Joachim Thompson, Issels, uh, and I think of those people maybe as the grandfathers because we already have some fathers here. Ed Arana, uh, who was the founding father of this meeting with Von Harada and Dietrich and these people are becoming the fathers of energy medicine. <laughs> you wanted to be a father again, didn't you, Dietrich? We're not getting into paternity suits or anything like this. This was a figurative language here. Uh, but our speakers uh, have always been leaders in their fields, eager to pass on their insights and their information, and uh, it's a real opportunity to come to spend time with them. And it's an opportunity to come spend time with the fellow attenders of these meetings, because I know that each year I get information and I learn so much from the people that I have lunch with and the people that I'm in, in, uh, at the booths with, uh, talking with the, with the people, who the vendors here who help support this meeting. Um, and I think it's our opportunity and it's our call to take this message back home with us. Um, and you know, the more meetings you go to, the, the less new stuff there is for you. This meeting always stretches me, though, and the, it's from this meeting that I take stuff back home that I can save somebody's tooth or save somebody's life or change somebody's life, and that's our chance, and that's our opportunity that we have this weekend. Uh, membership in the American Academy of Biological Dentis Dentistry supports these presentations. Uh, and supports the ability to continue this, these wonderful seminars that we have. I have a, I'm curious, how many of you are here for the first time? If you'd raise your hand. So we have about eight. How many people have been here for five meetings, or at least five meetings? 10 meetings. 10 meetings, we've got a handful. More than 10, 15. <laughs> One of the things that I would like to invite you to do that somebody did a couple years ago was bring somebody with you next year. Bring a colleague who's on the edge. Bring somebody who's dragging you. Bring a physician for whom this would, uh, this would, this would help your practice and help your patients and help his patients. If you're a physician, bring a dentist. Uh, we need to, we need to we need to spread this word, and this is a wonderful avenue and venue to do that. So I'm going to turn the podium over to Dietrich, who knows it well, um, and I look forward to each of you uh, learning a lot and taking home what you've learned and sharing it with your patients. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to point out that Bill is our president, and he comes from the same state as the president of this country comes from. And you can see that not all Texans are made of the same mold. <laughs> um, I want to ask Vaughn to say a few things. Vaughn Harada has been an old timer in this academy also, and uh, he just has a, a small sacred little thing that he wants to do with us. So, but restrict yourself. Vaughn is feared by many of us. He always goes over time. <laughs> like small but a loud voice. <laughs> Come. Come on. This is Thank you. Um, I want to wish all of you uh, a welcome here to our academy. and. Um, 
uh, share a couple of things with you. One of our, uh, this, I take this time, I've been asked to do this, uh, take a little quiet time. Um, we have uh, several members who have passed away, um, and um, uh, I'd like to um, also uh, uh, say they were, we honored um, Dr. Wolfram Kunau, uh, who was a, a great physician, German, one of our German icons in, in xenotransplants, live cell therapy, and one of the pioneers in stem cell work. He passed away at the age, I believe, it was 92. Uh, did his work with in Mexico. Was was trained in law prayer with Dr. Hans Nieper, uh, and was one of the beginning pioneers 40, 50 years ago for uh, for the work that was done in law prairie. Came over to Mexico to treat Steve McQueen in that situation there, and and many felt that uh, they helped recover him. He just passed away about six months ago, and we like to give condolences to him. Also. Uh, Dr. Stephen O'Dell, who was a member of our academy uh, for many, many years, a dentist, a biological dentist, uh, also just passed away this year, um, and uh, uh, we'd like to take a little time for him. Also, uh, one of the greatest scientists that I had known that I never could get to the academy here was Dr. George Merkel, who did work in unified field therapy in, in medicines of, of research area, also passed away this year. Um, I'd like to take a, also a moment, um, Dr. Chris Husser, who has been a past president of the Academy, could, could not be here today as he lost uh, one of the most cherished um, members of his family, Rambo, which was his dog, and he went to Irvine the other day and tried to save his life, and the dog had uh, taken, I think, some rat poison and passed away, and Chris was just in tears this morning. and. He just said to extend his love to all of you here, that he was wish he could be with you, but he said, would you please uh, send your prayers to him also? And uh, usually Chris is kind of like our spiritual guidance and leader, and he usually opens the meeting with a prayer. So I'd like for us to maybe just take one or two minutes, minutes of silence and send prayers to all these beings who have been supportive, because we know there is no death, that there's only transition. And maybe we take a minute right now to just say a prayer for these individuals and all those other individuals also in the world. Uh, we are going through some trying times right now. We have soldiers going over and we look at, look at potential war. So I want to put things in perspective and, and actually ex extend prayers out to everyone and, and uh, just take a little time of silence right now, please. May all these individuals be blessed, including all members of this group, that we may take what we've learned from this meeting and share it with the world and be light bearers and to send love and our knowledge and our healing to the world. Thank you very much. Thanks, Juan. No, that was no. I'm, I mean, hey, we're all evolving. <laughs> So uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming here. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to just say a few general remarks about our academy. Um, I want to start with uh, just talking a little bit about Ed. Ed was uh, really the first. Ed Orana was one of the first people here in this country to embrace uh, some of us Germans and brought over some of uh, my teachers. and. Uh, had the intuition and the connection to the truth that he could, in spite of the Second World War and what happened there, recognize that not everything that was over there was bad and open the door for uh, some of these one of people to come over here and uh, place their, their ideas here. And they found on very fertile ground. And things have grown very much over the last you know, 20 years or so it's been. I met Ed 
1986, um, when we were both uh, updating ourselves on electroacupuncture and had a course with Dr. Langrader, which was one of the more less known geniuses over there who had introduced a lot of valuable ideas to us. And uh, Ed, you know, went the EAV way, and I later on went the muscle testing way, which is using the same physiology. Um, there's been some historical notes that I wanted to, to say. One uh, issue that evolved <coughs> is what is biological dentistry? Well, biological dentistry is that particular form of dentistry that acknowledges that the teeth belong to the body. <laughs> yeah? If you want a quick definition, yeah? Biolog everybody is a biological dentist who acknowledges that the teeth are part of the body. Yeah? As you know, uh, amalgam silver fillings are uh, not uh, considered by the FDA of being something that's in the body, but it is classified uh, similar to a, an instrument, something that's outside the body that doesn't have to go through the same safety studies and so forth as other things have to, even though we know that the, uh, the lateral canals and the teeth, the dentin tubules, are a very integral, very alive part of the immune system, that the, uh, the, the hollow tubes are right wiring information into the immune system, and it's a vibrant reactive system, and what you do on one tooth very much affects the entire uh, body through this connection. And biological dentistry is the only form of dentistry that has discovered that and holds that idea. It's congruent with science, uh, but not congruent with politics. And therefore, we can say that biological dentistry is the only form of dentistry that is based in science. Think about it for a moment. It's the only form of dentistry that is based in our modern understanding of physio physiology immunology, anatomy, and science. And the conventional form of dentistry is based on politics, greed, power, play, and other things. I'm an outsider, so I can say I'm using my First Amendment right, which is a wonderful right. I realized, you know, I didn't know that, but in Germany, even though the German Constitution was tailored after the American Constitution after the war, I do not have a, f a right for free speech in Germany. It is actually, I got sued. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I had long the position that it is not safe to use bioresonance therapy for heavy metal detox. You know, the, uh, the instruments that we all used to use uh, in the past, you know, where you, you take an electrode and you wire in the, uh, the mercury information in one hand, and it comes out the other way. When you're in the circuitry. The Mora has a setup and several other machines. Uh, and treating people with, with the frequency of mercury and running it through the body, what we realized very early on, it stirs the hell up of the metals in the body, but it doesn't mean they're coming out. It just means you're stirring them up and displacing them, usually from one body compartment into another one. And depending on the oxidative status and so forth in the system, it usually moves to worse places than before. And we had plenty of evidence here between me and Doug Lieber and Andy Landerman. And like some people, we had like a nice sort of talking gossip line on the phone and we sharing observations over the years. And um, that heavy metal detox is, is a thing where you want to make sure the direction is from in, like in homeopathy, from top down and from the inside out. Yeah. What's that law called? I think Herring's Law. Um, and uh, we want to make sure when we use EAV or our other techniques that the direction of flow is in that direction. And uh, I was just mentioning that in Germany at the lecture, just kind of and giving them examples, showing them patients I had in the practice, you know, that actually were completely crashed, you know, by uh, doing that form of bioresonance therapy without acknowledging the biochemistry at all. That there is not only energy medicine, but there's also biochemistry. There's a place for it. And uh, then I got three lawsuits from, <laughs> from all these manufacturers. <laughs> and and uh, having been uh, 
Galileo in one of my past lives. I remember what I did then that worked. <clears throat> I said, okay, I'm offering you something. I'm going to give a big speech in front of a big audience, and I'm going to reverse my statement. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and we're going to send them the proof. Yeah, we're going to publish a paper on it and then send them a proof. And so um, we, <laughs> we had this lecture. There were 500 people there, and I gave this lecture. And in the early part of the lecture, I, uh, I said, well, you know, bioresonance therapy is really wonderful and all these things. And then uh, we told the cameraman, and now the official part of the lecture is finished, and there's a little extra part at the end. And then I said, and well, here's the precautions. <laughs> And then I told them the rest of the story off the tape. And then the attorneys were very happy with the tape that we sent them and the proof and the printed article on the lecture. And I got away with it. But there's actually no freedom of speech over there. You know, I cannot say what is true for me. I have to, um, you know, as soon as it's damaging to anybody's business, also I can't say it. And it's really a wonderful thing here in America that we can't say things still. I mean, at least. <laughs> <laughs> you mean later when you get the tax audit or the Medicare audit after you said something? Yeah. So um, within biological dentistry, there is one particular statement that has emerged as a core piece of, of it all that I'd like to put in the beginning. It has emerged in the world literature now as the Arana axiom. Okay, an axiom is a statement of truth that is so true that you cannot prove it. It's like you know, when you say, well, there is God, but you can't do a double-blind study on proving it. Yeah? So saying that there's God is an axiom. So by experience, some of us know there is somebody there, but we can't prove it. And the Arana axiom is very similar to that. The Arana axiom has to do with the basic foundation of biological dentistry that the teeth are connected to the body. And that means whatever you do to a tooth will have an expression in the body, positive or negative, will have an effect on the body. And the Arana axiom is very simple. It is the answer to the question, how do I know if something in the mouth is causing physical problems elsewhere? Does a tooth cause a problem elsewhere in the body? Yeah, that's a foundational question of this academy. And the answer to the question was, and this is the Arana axiom, we ask the patient to open their mouth. If you look in the mouth and you see any dental work in there, you know that there's a problem. <laughs> yeah. That uh, pretty much captures the wisdom of Ed and most of us haven't really gone beyond that point. We may use x-rays, you know, to, um, or now the, the different scans that are Bob Jones' uh, PET uh, ultrasound unit or thermography or whatever. But the basic foundation has always been the same. We look in the mouth. If there's any dentistry in there, we know uh, that the patient's health is affected by it. And if we have a patient in ill health, and we want to know if the teeth are part of the ill health problem, the axiom applies. We ask the patient to open their mouth. If we see any dental work in there, we know that the patient's health problem is in part, major part, small part, big part, in part affected by what is in the mouth. And then everything else we do in this work is trying to find out, trying to develop diagnostic methods to figure out what part of the problem is caused by the teeth and if there's any doable solutions or not. So these are two things I wanted to say in the beginning. One, biological dentistry is the form of dentistry that is based in true science and acknowledges that the teeth are part of the body, which is a complete deviation from what is taught in dental school. Yeah? And I'm proud to be part of this group. Um, it has been rapidly growing uh, elsewhere in the world. I know in Brazil, South America, biological dentistry is very, very big. Um, I was uh, in 1997 
I visited uh, the place where my mother grew up, which is in Poland. And uh, one of her, the only surviving person that's still alive from her childhood was a woman uh, that lived there who just had had bypass surgery. And I had a chance to talk to her about medicine in Poland. And she said, oh yeah, no, we have several major heart clinics here and they have a very good reputation in the Eastern world. And uh, the way the heart clinics are arranged is that half the clinic is taking care of the heart patients and doing the operations. The other half of the building is occupied by dentists. And before they do any, any bypass surgery or any cardiac heart valve replacement or so, they do three things. They take out all the amalgam fillings, they remove any dead teeth, and they remove any teeth that have root canals. Right. In Poland. This is in Poland. Yeah, and some of you know, like I do, the many Polish jokes. <laughs> and the interesting thing is the Polish jokes are usually told by Americans or Westerners that actually are the matter of the jokes of the Poles. These, these people in those heart clinics, they kind of go, you know, and guess what, you know, in my clinic, they don't know anything about the teeth, you know, causing heart problems. And they're operating these people without keep taking their fillings out. And they're having a good laugh about us. So I thought I'd share that with you, because it's interesting that in other parts of the world, and typically in parts of the world that isn't, can't afford financial corruption and power play, where it's the nitty gritty of the everyday, our form of medicine is emerging very rapidly uh, as the, the, the form that is doable and is sustainable and leads to sustainable uh, methods that aren't damaging to the population where uh, prevention is big and there is no money to keep people alive that have been damaged iatrogenically with infected teeth and with, you know, with screwing their health up with different ways. So it was wonderful for me to hear. The, the Russian physiologist Anna Pavlov, the school Anna Pavlov, they did this wonderful study that showed when you put, uh, they did a dog study where they, they opened up a tooth of a dog and put a little formaldehyde on the tooth, a dab of formaldehyde. And within 24 hours, they could find the formaldehyde in the hypothalamus, concluding from there that everything that's in the tooth, if it's on the tooth, if it's in contact with the dentin uh, tubules, ends up is wired straight from there through the nerves to the brain stem and into the brain. It takes only 24 hours. And the rats would die and the animals would die, you know, of the, of the poison that was placed on the tooth in minute amounts. And they concluded from there, this is, I'm talking 1932, they concluded from there, it is not safe to put anything in contact with the dentin tubules that's not, uh, that is toxic or not biocompatible, 1932. And the whole Russian dentistry is aware of the problems that we are just becoming aware of now. So I just wanted to also put our group here in context with the rest of the world that fortunately we are not alone. And even though, um, and I'd be pleased, I include myself when I say Americans. I'm very down on the Americans since Bush is in government. It's a personal thing, you know, like we've, we Germans, Germans have been through the, the Hitler time and the Holocaust and it's still been very fresh when I was born. And just uh, some of the remarks, you know, some of the speeches that Bush gave, there's actually quotations in there that are directly translations from Hitler's wonderful book, Mein Kampf. You know, the, 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 the sentence that most of you know from Bush, yeah, if you're not with us, you're against us. Hitler said that sentence in his original statement when he took over the government that was in his first speech. And believe me, it gave me the EBGBs. And I am not for this man because of my own emotional background. He may be a good guy and everything, and it may turn out all very well, but being German, it's not possible to like this man because of his similarities in the way he, he speaks and rallies up, bullies people and stuff. We've been through that. And so we're damaged in that way, in a certain way, and can't maybe see the truth if there's another truth there. Um, uh, but as Americans, you know, think ourselves often in the role of leadership in the world, in science and other ways. And 
Uh, and believe me, it is an illusion. Yeah, it is an illusion. We're in leadership of having power and having the money. We could do it all. We could have true leadership. We could really move the world forward, but we are not doing it. You know, the, the real research, the real findings that I'm aware of, the real progress is made uh, on little fronts over here and over there and over here and over there. But I haven't seen it happening here. I mean, some of you have been through it. You know, that any person that kind of sticks out a little bit, that takes some leadership in a particular avenue, uh, is scared to death um, because of what they know and what they do. And um, it hasn't been easy to grow here. And uh, I found it wonderful that this group has been there. Like, it's been one of my two or three uh, real peer groups of, uh, of people that are very like-minded and have a similar um, spiritual orientation, you know, where we feel not only responsible to the patient, but also to this wonderful planet, you know, that we're watching sort of being destroyed by the same interests that are trying to restrain our licenses, trying to restrain our creativity, trying to find better solutions. And so, um, against that backdrop, um, within this group, uh, I think there have been some major, major progresses uh, that have been made. I think it is pretty much us who tied up uh, the root canal issue under, really under leadership of George Meinig, who uh, reviewed the original material by Western Price, which, by the way, was also the inspiration of the original German physicians in the 30s and 40s, out of which Dr. Kramer and Dr. Turk came, who were the teachers of Adorana, Chris Hassa, and many others in the surgical techniques. They're the surgical techniques that we're using now to operate cavitations have pretty much had been, to my knowledge, had been developed uh, before the Second World War in Germany. Then it got silenced for a while and then reemerged there. And then the teaching came over here with the tendency that more radical in general is better. The sicker the patient, the more radical the surgery needs to be. There's lots of argument about that amongst people that are just watching, but there's no argument about people that treat really sick people. You know, when you see really sick people, somebody who's in a wheelchair who can't breathe anymore, somebody who's a terminal of some illness or another, we know if we radically clean the mouth up, and radically means radically, that means we don't leave any infectious material behind, that means the surgeries are deeper, they sometimes risk the life of the nerve, but that has often been the life-saving procedure. and those surgical technique with the precautions and stuff have emerged through Kramer and Turk in Germany and came back over here uh, pretty much under the leadership of Ed O'Rana. I've been teaching just a handful of people who then became the teachers of others. And then now most of the dentists here in the room do, uh, do the surgeries to one degree or another. And for me, it's like amazing. Uh, 12 years ago when I first was here, um, there wasn't a single dentist in the room who knew how to operate a cavitation. I mean, at the time, the argument was, is there such a thing as a cavitation? It was a hypothetical thing. You know, there was a ghost that we were chasing. And now, like, how many of you here in the room, just by show of hands, have accepted the concept of a cavitation? So accept the idea that they're there and that it may cause health problems. How many of you do that? Okay, so it's a substantial part of you, you know, and if you asked the same question 12 years ago, there wasn't a single hand going up, you know. If I ask you how many of you would give it a possibility, you know, yeah, lots of arms would have gone up, you know, would have, cons you know, made some space in your brain for it, but there wasn't a single person actually doing it. And the, so we've grown, like, uh, tremendously, and, like, when I hear now, and of <laughs> I was funny, my position uh, was funny then. At the time, I tried to point people towards it and said, listen, like, you know, here's a patient with breast cancer. This is one of the components. We need to take this tooth out. We need to do that. And making phone calls, you know, holding patients' hands and kind of trying to find a dentist, a, a dental surgeon who was willing to do this was a nightmare. Now I find myself in the opposite position. You know, the patients come to me and say, well, I saw my dentist and he said, I've got five cavitations here. And he wants to operate them all. Do, you really need, do I really need those all done? 
And I find myself more in the position where, whoa, 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 wait a moment. Yeah, so I, you know, let me test you. And you know, I retest the patient and say, yes, there's five cavitations, but you have a systemic infection that doesn't disappear by just taking the few focal areas out. We first need to treat, give you a whole body treatment, and then address the cavitations. And we may just have to operate one or maybe none of them. So I find myself now, 12 years later, more in the position of putting, putting the brakes on the dentist <laughs> rather than speeding them up because you know the, the way the pendulum swings. <laughs> and um, I, uh, I'm an old meditator. And you know the Buddhist way is sort of the, the middle of a road. And you're trying to keep the pendulum swings like to a minimum. <laughs> and so, so it's like, you know, we've been sort of pushing this thing sort of and suddenly the the <laughs> the ball is rolling and it's rolling maybe a little bit too fast in some areas. The same with the with the amalgam removal, you know, like there is uh, contraindications as times in a patient's life and it's not appropriate um, to take the fillings out uh, in my opinion. Yeah? Like if you have an eighty year old man who's been very happily married and has a good life and he's still fully functional and he's got amalgam fillings I do not tell him to take him out. You know, when you know his prospective lifespan is ten years or less, maybe, you know, and he's doing very well, and his whole personality and being is so adapted around the amalgam that I don't see a reason for rattling the boat, and uh, that sometimes where the the dentists I'm working with need to be a little restrained in in some way, and so um, I think we've we've come a very long way. Uh, with all of this. And um, now with Bob Jones, you know, having his caveat approved by the FDA, at least that's the information I have. Is it true, actually? Sure. Yeah, because yeah. uh, we don't want to do that same mistake again that we jump for joy too soon. Uh, with the caveat, my, my concern is, yes, the caveat shows areas of low density in the bone. But it doesn't show that these areas are causing a health problem. That is another diagnostic step that needs to be done. And I find uh, that very often missing. You know, and the patients that come through my office uh, from various walks of life. And most of my patients are from out of state. So I, I've <laughs> seen patients for many of you guys. I see you know, the, the, peop the people where things don't go well. So I've develop my, my uh, practice in that way, to check up on everybody, to, to see which way I feel I have to steer a little bit. You know, are people now getting it? Are they getting it too much? <laughs> and um, so with the cavitat, uh, my, uh, my concern is that it very accurately diagnoses uh, abnormalities in the jawbone, but it does not say whether these abnormalities are causing trouble or not. And whether surgery is the best solution for it. You know, many of you now have done enough surgery to know that the surgeries in about 50% of cases, the way they're done right now, my statistic from observing is about 50% of the cavitations, the surgery is done in the mouth, the root canal clean up, people are actually getting better. And 50% they're not. And now for me, that's not good enough. Because um, I'm a perfectionist, and that maybe is the, the only gift maybe that comes from Germany is that that compulsive uh, sort of accuracy that they have about stuff that's sometimes self-limiting. Uh, but 50% ain't ain't enough, and so we went from uh, using these different techniques, X-rays, cavitat, thermography, uh, to try to establish which which ones of these holes in the bone or which ones of these bad teeth are causing actual trouble or not. And the really, like, we have to give the, the main credit uh, to this to Dr. Foll, who developed the electroacupuncture, um, a technique that most of you are familiar with that is based on one simple principle, and that is the first principle is that when you introduce any substance, any material thing or energetic thing into the patient's energy field, which exists outside the body, 
the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic portion of the autonomic nervous system, is aware of it, measures it, calibrates it, analyzes it, and responds to it either with no response, with the stress response, or with the healing response. There's three responses the sympathetic nervous system can initiate. And it is obviously a survival mechanism that is way older than language or the development of our five senses. The five senses are specialized organs to detect things in our environment. Yeah? Like the eyesight goes very far. You can see for miles and miles on a clear day and see things coming. If there's a spaceship coming with aliens in it, you can see it from miles away and you can run for shelter and protect yourself. Yeah? Or hearing goes pretty fast. Yeah? It goes pretty far. Uh, not as far as eyesight because hearing depends on one air molecule after another being pushed. And sound travels relatively slow compared to sight. So the warnings that we get from the ears are coming slower and later. And then, of course, there is smell. Smell is like, you know, if something explodes three miles away, we probably won't smell it unless the wind carries it our way. But if somebody farts, you know, close to us, we know it and we can detect by the smell whether this is a safe person or not. <laughs> <laughs> and then if it even gets closer in, there's a the sense of touch. We know things are pretty close and dangerous, you know, when they're touching us. And then the first sense on the way inside is the sense of taste. And when we're tasting things, we know things are pretty bad. You know, when they're already on the tongue, we're tasting them. And it's cyanide, we know it's too late. We saw it. We heard it. We heard the person, I'm going to come poison you. You know, then we, you know, we smelled them. And we still didn't react. And now we're tasting it. And now, now we know the only chance we have now is whatever, washing our mouth out, throwing up, or doing some last minute maneuver. Now, the autonomic nervous system has been preceding all of this. Because we know that jellyfish and very primitive animals and even plants have the equivalent of an autonomic nervous system. It's a system, a fine wiring of unprotected nerves that is exposed to electromagnetic energy of all frequency bands. And it is sensing that when the body is um, beamed at with any frequency on the electromagnetic spectrum, the autonomic nervous system gives a response. Um, a Japanese university did a wonderful study on light um, they, they had a darkened room, and they used an LED light. 50 yards away was a long hall, 50 yards away from the patient, and putting electrodes uh, onto the brain. And the LED light was shielded uh, under black cloth, so it couldn't be seen. And just the, the on position and the off position of the very weak LED light 50 yards away was detected by the brain stem. 50 yards away. Um, there is many other studies. You know, Alma Green did wonderful studies with EEG uh, that showed the, the reverse, that the EEG of a patient can be measured many, many yards away from the patient. You know, that actually the brain waves create an electric field that goes way out into the field of the patient. And I could go on and on and on. But the bottom line is the sympathetic nervous system is a detection system that detects electromagnetic frequencies and converts it into afferent information that informs the brain whether the environment, the outer environment, and the inner environment is safe or neutral or dangerous. Yeah, that is the main job of the sympathetic nervous system. And Dr. Voll was the first one who recognized that. He was actually a student of Reich's work, William Reich. Some of you know of him was a pioneer in psychology. He, wore one of, he was one of the uh, three main students of uh, uh, Sigmund Freud. Freud had three students. One was Carl Jung, the other one was Adler, and the other one was Reich, creating three entirely different directions of psychotherapy. You know, Reich was responsible for what we now call humanistic psychology and body-oriented psychotherapy. You know, any of the body-oriented approaches in psychotherapy go back to Reich's work. And Reich was the first one to develop an instrument 
uh, to measure the autonomic nervous system. And uh, with the advent of, of the Nazi uh, terror regime in, in Germany, he left and came to America and uh, found himself in a different kind of terror regime. You know, if you, some of you know that his books were burned as late as night. When was the 1960-something? I mean, we had a book burning of all his books. In the 60s, you know, the U.S. is burning somebody's books, you know, where we have a First Amendment, you know, that covers really writing and speaking. I mentioned it before. <laughs> and I insist, I insist that the First Amendment is still uh, the law of the day, but it sometimes doesn't get respected. But Foll was the man who grabbed Reich's work. He knew about him. He knew him personally. And he quietly developed his work uh, out of his own despair. He had bladder cancer and wanted to find a way of living a little longer. And a little longer turned out to be 30-some years. Uh, by balancing his system, uh, by uh, learning, ha having developed the system where he measured the stress in the autonomic nervous system uh, simply through skin conductance. You know, when the sympathetic nervous system goes in a stress state, the skin gets moist, you know, sweating. The sweat glands are innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. So when, the, when there's stress in the system, the little bubbles in the skin where the sweat glands are, it's not necessarily the skin gets moist, but the bubbles fill instantly up with a little bit more fluid, ready to release it as sweat. And whenever the bubbles are full in the skin, and you put an electric current through the skin, it travels easier because the bubbles are full of electrolyte solution. That means the skin conductivity changes. The more stress you're in, the more conductive the skin becomes. And they said electrodermal testing, we call it now EDS, or e electrodermal screening. It used to be called EAV. I don't know when that shift came from EAV to EDS. Um, it's it's a it's again like a, so in a way a curse of modern times to to take techniques and eliminate the founder of the technique to not to not give him credit not honor him and take him out of the thing I call it EAV and I always will as long as I live to just honor the the guy who created it um, so Dr Vol developed the electrodermal testing by measuring the the amount of resistance of the skin in acupuncture points, and then placed things in the energy field of the patient to see if it would cause stress or ameliorate stress. Yeah? If somebody had a bladder infection, and he would introduce, um, in those days, a sulfonamide like Bactrim into the circuitry of the machine or into the energy field of the patient, and he realized that the stress in the bladder point that was there before went away by placing the sulfonamide, he postulated that this must be a good treatment and then treated with that substance. And then uh, did a number of studies in hospitals. He was wonderful. He went with every idea he had. He went to the local hospital and said, give me 10 patients with breast cancer. Give me 10 patients with kidney failure, with kidney <coughs> infections. You know, and he would study them with his method and compare with what the medical doctors found. You know? and then developed uh, the electroacupuncture system that we're using until today. And it is most remarkable for me, reading some of his old work, that if I look at the most modern EAV machines, when I carefully look in, there's very, very few things in there that weren't already in Dr. Fall's writing. You know? So he pretty much single-handedly delivered the method, developed it to a very, very mature degree which is, I, th I think, an incredible accomplishment. And by the way, I can say that here because the seminar is on the energetics of dentistry. So I can say that here freely. The way Dr. Fall found the points that he is testing is by using a pendulum. Yeah, he was a professional dowser. All since his childhood, he had a gift of using dowsing rods and finding water lines. Uh, of He learned from his mom how to diagnose illness in people with dowsing rods. And when he went over the liver, you know, the thing would kind of move one way or another and use the pendulum as well. And he found all the acupuncture points that are given in all his original writings through dowsing. He, at this time, he felt it was not a good idea to talk about it and kept that very private. 
because he knew the politics of his time and the restrictions of the human brain that, that our belief systems are restricting us from accepting new information unless it's um, uh, presented in a way that we can accept. And so he, he is one of my wonderful heroes. And then out of him came the first round of students, which was basically uh, Dr. Kramer and Dr. Schimmel. Dr. Schimmel, uh, who is still alive, developed the, uh, the bigger test method and then uh, went on uh, to develop other systems. But he's been my personal most influential teacher. He developed the causal chains. That means the idea that illness comes into the body in one place of weakness and then disperses itself into different systems. That means for the dentist, you know, by the time you get a jaw problem, the jaw problem may be the last system that fails. There may be already six or seven other steps that the illness took in the body. It may have started with a chlamydia infection, you know, from, from intercourse, and then it was overlooked, it was asymptomatic, and the chlamydia established a housekeeping here, and then went to the pancreas, and then from the pancreas went to, into the jaw joint, or first into the immune system, paralyzing the white cells, and then ending up in the jaw joint. And a patient like this, you can treat many, many years with splints and other techniques, and they will work because splints increase the lymph drainage, and the blood flow into a tissue, and it will gradually improve situations. But if you can make the diagnosis that there's a chlamydia infection, and treating it in the jaw ain't enough, you also need to find it in the pancreas and in the pelvis, and treat it as a systemic illness, then the jaw problem will go away. So he called those sequences of how an illness enters and then travels to other places, he caused that, called that causal chain. And in our system now of testing, we call it prioritizing. Uh, that means any good system, EAV or muscle testing, we, uh, we test, we see what the problems are in the patient, and then we establish a sequence. We say, well, this problem is more important than this one, or this one is causing this one, and therefore we're not treating the effect, we're trying to find the cause. But this one isn't primary, it's caused by this one. And so the issue that has been terribly misunderstood in dentistry, and one of the reasons I'm speaking to you, is when we find somebody who has a cavitation in a lower right wisdom tooth area. Yeah, we know, OK, that's linked, according to Dr. Foll, to the small intestine meridian and to the heart. So this is a patient we typically find with a gut full of parasites. Yeah, and heart palpitations or angina. And then uh, we tend to say, well, let's do the cavitation and everything should improve. Yeah. Now, with applying Dr. Schimmel's thinking, um, the heart and small intestine in acupuncture, that's the element of fire. Yeah. And we know in the five element theory in acupuncture, and this comes into this, there's a relationship between fire and water. And we may find out very well that this patient had, 20 years ago, had a very bad kidney infection that was treated at the time with antibiotics and then seemed to go away. But the patient never really recovered. He stayed sort of ill then, and sort of, and now he's really ill. Now you know, he got chronic fatigue and maybe breast cancer she, yeah, or prostate cancer. And then it is not enough to go back and do this cavitation. Yeah. We know that the fire element in the patient was weakened <coughs> because the, it went out of hand. Yeah, the fire had too much energy in it, the fire element in, in the five element theory, because the water element was dead in the patient. The kidneys weren't working right and there wasn't enough energy in the water system, and it takes water to balance the fire. So the fire went raging. Yeah? That's an energetic way of looking at these causal chains. And then if you're testing, either bioenergetic testing or uh, do muscle testing, you want to find the wisdom tooth as a primary disturbance causing gut problems and heart problems. 
but you don't want to stop there. You want to see, well, what was bringing that on? And then we find, aha, it was a kidney infection 10 years ago or 20 years ago, and there's still some whatever beta hemolytic strep in the kidney today that's slowly smoldering there, eating away at the kidneys. And there's no point in operating the tooth first. We want to find out that there's this kidney problem and fix that first. And then the magic often happens. When we go to the original thing, we often see that on its own, within a few weeks or a few months, the x-ray changes. The tooth suddenly starts to heal. And that is something many of you in the room still do not believe us, yeah, because you see every day, you see the evidence, you see the x-rays, and we're still holding the belief that if something is structural, like a bad bite, or hole in the bone, that it cannot change. And certainly, when you've done those surgery and see the stinky yellow-green mass coming out of there, you know that could have never healed on its own. And yet, some of us old-timers, we do believe that we have plenty of proof that it can, if you give them it the right condition. If you're going back to the origin of the illness in, in your energetic testing, if you find out what is behind that. Yeah? And I've stretched this model in the last uh, 15 years by then, you know, not only going to the kidney infection that was there 20 years ago, but I want to find out why was this kidney infection there? Because I certainly never had one, but why did this patient have one? Why was the kidney energetically weak? And first of all, it led us into the area of heavy metal toxicity. We found out, oh yeah, this patient was highly severely injured with, with the mercury amalgam fillings. Um, so there were metal, there was tin and silver and mercury in the kidneys, which made it vulnerable. And then the question came up, well, why did the mercury in this patient go to the kidney? Whereas in me, you know, it went into my brain, or in this patient it went to the thyroid. Why did it go to the kidney? And then uh, we realized it was the psychology that determined where the patient gets injured, where the initial blow is. And so we learned how to detect from the initial, from the primary focus, we call this. We learned that behind the primary focus is usually toxicity of some sort, and behind that is some unresolved psychological conflicts. And at first, we were looking in the normal model of medicine and psychology, we're looking at early childhood trauma which we found regularly. Somebody's been abused in some way. Somebody didn't get the nurturing they needed. Uh, somebody lost somebody close to them. And there was a big unresolved pain that created a weakness in the body somewhere. And then we realized that model was too restricted. And very often by using, I use muscle testing as a tool, but those who use EAV found the same thing. Very often we found that those organs get injured that are not only weak in this lifetime, but there is a weakness passed on by the parents to them. And we found out that very often there was a severe psychological or physical trauma two or three generations back that was completely unhealed. And that the, that the compromise, the energetic compromise of an organ was actually predetermined by a trauma in the family two or three generations back and that we could actually develop some healing work that would lead us back to that original event. And when we cleared that up, suddenly the kidneys came back to life, and within a few months, the jawbone stopped aching, and we said, well, let's take another x-ray and see, and certainly there was no more cavitation there. There was an absolute physical healing based on going back to the origin of the weakness. We were quite happy with that, and then the genome project came along. The genome project, uh, many of you have followed it, you know, that discovered um, that we have as many genes as American sweet corn. Yeah? There was in the very first sort of publication was that we have an almost identical number of genes and gene sequences as sweet corn. Now, don't underestimate sweet corn. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you like a few things. First of all, there's male corn and female corn. And the female corn, you know, those little uh, tentacles that hang out, do you know what that is on sweet corn? 
The tassels, do you know what that is? The fallopian tubes. Yeah? Uh, every single bead on the, on the cob has an inner tube that ends up in this tassel, which is a fallopian tube. And it needs to receive the sperm through the air. It needs to attach to the fallopian tube, travel inside it to the corn. So in that you can see, oh, now I understand why sweet corn has as many genes as we, because we have only two fallopian tubes. And the female sweet corn <laughs> has hundreds of them. So it's in, in, in that way, it is clearly more evolved than we are. And in other ways, it's not as re evolved, like it can't walk. <laughs> but you know, when, I, when the first statistics on that came out, it was clear to me, I took that as a proof and said, I must be on the right way. The complexity of a human being cannot be explained based on the genes. However, it was like almost like I was the only person in the world that discovered that. Everybody else said, based on this information, we now know we're going to be able to cure everything by looking at the genes and fixing the genes. It made no sense to me. You know? And so far, there is a genetic testing available now through Great Smokey's lab. Uh, we've done it. You know, we've, we've kind of come up with all these things that people should have. And yet, they don't have it. Yeah, that people should have this illness and that illness based on the genetic testing. There seems to be very little relationship between the results that you get in the genetic testing and you being able to predict what's going to be helpful to the patient. It was very disappointing. I don't know if some of you have other opinions on this. I hope you do. I hope that I'm wrong on this one. But it's been remarkably disappointing in my practice you know, to include this. and so. Uh, we're staying right now with the energetics of it. We're saying genes can be turned on and can be turned off. And we know how the communication to genes works. You know, there is these wonderful receptors on the cell wall, and the information goes in, and it triggers genes to be activated or inactivated. And I'm not even so concerned about what genes are there. I'm interested in activating the ones that are good for the patient and inactivating the ones that aren't. And the wonderful thing is that the mind and the subconscious mind seem to be the places that determine those signals. I uh, may show you in a minute like a little bit of the physiology, but I can just talk you through it. You know, the, uh, the way the limbic system works, the limbic system, the hippocampus and the amygdala, it doesn't really matter where they are, but they're somewhere in there. They're the ones that hold memory, not only your own personal life memory, but we know now for sure with good research from the moment of conception on, there is recording happening there. And we know that ancestral influences are also recorded there. And from the limbic system, there's a direct pathway called the limbic hypothalamic axis, a wonderful little bunch of wires about the size of the telephone net of New York going from the limbic system into the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus, the anterior part, is regulating the parasympathetic nervous system, which is mostly expressed in the body in this area. Yeah, if you're a dentist, you're really a parasympathetic neurologist. And the posterior hypothalamus is the sympathetic control. And so that's wired directly into the limbic system. From here, the signal goes to the brain stem. And in the parasympathetic nervous system, there's three major switching st uh, centers there, nucleus solitarius, uh, nucleus ambiguus, and the dorsal motor nucleus. There are three structures. And from here, the signals run all over into the body. And the way we know now that when you have a deeply held fear, let's say um, your mom was pregnant with you, you were conceived as a twin, your mom tried to abort you, there was a knife, it got the twin but didn't get you. You survive. You don't know anything about it. But sure enough, when I test you, I find out. Because your kidney is going to be testing. The emotion that tests with is going to be fear. We ask a few questions, and we're going to be back in the room in like three minutes and find out what happened. And we're going to ask mom on the phone before we go any further, mom, did you do this? And mom routinely first going to go pale, and then she's going to say, of course not, dear. And then uh, most moms call back an hour later after they cried themselves out and kind of say, 
yes, you know, we tried to abort you, uh, and there certainly something came out that looked like you, but it was not you, it was your twin. And now, when this person goes on to live, they live usually with a tremendous amount of fear. They don't know where the fear comes from. The kidneys are dysfunctional, and they get all the downhill problems. And they may look now, they're 40 years old, they may look like Lyme disease, they may look like chronic fatigue, they may look like a cancer patient, they may look like a chronic depressed person. The appearance of the illness can take any shape or form. But our job is to go through the symptoms that the patient has back to the very core of the origin. And when we resolve that, the limbic system stops sending the way the impulse travels you know, from the limbic system when the unresolved conflict is there, travels from the limbic system, these pathways down into the kidneys, leading to a gross disturbance of the neuropeptides or neurotransmitters that the kidney needs to stay healthy. It's wonderful osteopathic research from the 50s, but they did one thing. They put a little band around the autonomic nerves, the parasympathetic nerves that go into the kidney, put a little band around it and tied it up, just tied a knot around it. And then what they found out, that within six months, the kidney shriveled up to half its size. And if they left it there, the animal would die. And what they concluded from there was very simple that the parasympathetic nervous system is used to pump a number of growth factors continuously into the organs to sustain their health. And organs become ill when that autonomic impulse doesn't happen anymore. And so our job is to find out with our different methods, to find out what is strangulating the flow of health via the neurotransmitters into these different places in our body. And so me and others have been going this way. Um, I probably show like a few slides. I need to see what the time is. How long do I have? Do we? Okay. So I'm just going to show a few slides, a few overheads, um, out of different areas, and then uh, do a little demonstration how the testing works. Um, I'm going to ask for a volunteer. I had somebody who was supposed to travel in. Oh yeah, she's there. Uh, recheck on somebody. Um, to, to bring this near. But before I go into the overheads, is there any questions at this point? Am I boring you? I mean, I, you need to let me know, because. If you, yeah, no, no, but that's a very problem. You know, nobody there that I met uh, spoke uh, English or German, you know, they speak Russian and Polish, and communication is difficult. And the woman that I met then, she's died since, so I have no contacts over there. And, but I know it should be easy to do, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No, um, when I say 50%, by taking all the referrals that I'm getting together and looking at the work uh, that was done, it is my impression that it's about there. Um, but of course, you know, it's individual dependent. Yeah. Wouldn't so. You, would you say that most of your referrals are going to be the failures that have come through? Yeah. And my, I may have yeah, a more. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, one of the things I do encourage you in passing the ball back to you is like, we need an outcome study on, on cavitation surgery, a very simple outcome study. You know, how many people are operated every day, what are the symptoms they come in with, rating the symptom on a scale from one to 10, you know, and six months, uh, whatever, six weeks later, six months later, and six years later, what is the outcome? Yeah, our impression is there's many improvements that are there for the first few weeks and then a predictable number of people sort of re seem to relapse. Um, if, now this is if the cavitation is the main and only thing done. Now if the patient is covered with some form of systemic uh, naturopathic type therapy, you know, where they also uh, are detoxed and where they're also given drainage remedies, 
but they're also given some degree of counseling and addressing the other issues, the success rate goes up. Yeah? But it's like, I'm here to challenge you. I'm not, not necessarily here to give you, I'm a right brain type, so I'm throwing things out at you uh, and you see what you resonate with. And, but we do need an outcome study very, very soon, you know, especially in the current legal climate. Um, and that's something we, I think, owe um, to even the most conservative people in the world, you know, that we cannot go along anymore. There was this <laughs> wonderful study that came out last year that was uh, on arthroscopic knee surgery you know, for osteoarthritis, which is a technique done now for 20 years. You know, everybody with osteoarthritis in the U.S. gets a suggestion, you know, well, let's remove those bone spurs and stuff. And did a, a placebo-controlled uh, double-blind, no, it wasn't double-blinded, it, uh, the operator wasn't blind while he was operating. Well, it was a placebo-controlled study, but with it in one group of patients, they just did the incisions, pretending they had the surgery, put them under an anesthesia. In the other group, they did the real surgery. There was no statistical difference. In fact, the group that wasn't operated did slightly better than the group that was operated. And I do uh, encourage you, you dentists here in the room and the physicians like myself, we need to gang up design a study that can be easily done. You know, with the patient, all we need is a questionnaire. And there is in, I know, Anne McCombs, uh, and show who you are. Uh, I've seen under the American Holistic Medical Association had a questionnaire a, few, a couple of years ago for a simple thing for outcome studies that anybody could do. And it's really as simple as that, it just having the patient fill out a questionnaire before they have surgery and then at various times after the surgery and, and would you be willing to have people talk to you in the break how to get uh, uh, to this? Yeah. Would be great if you if you could, because I you know it's a, it's a thing dear to my heart. The same is true with amalgam removal. You know, it's there's all these wonderful studies out on the theory of heavy metal toxicity, and then there's a lot of theoreticians, a growing number of theoreticians out there, advising people how to you know detox people, and then there's the people that actually see real patients, and the suggestions you know that are made and you're going to hear some in this weekend you know how to detox people are going to vary greatly depending on the personal experience of the practitioner making the recommendations yeah i have my own way that has developed with treating mostly uh, people with cancer ms and als andy cutler is here has developed a wonderful program working uh, with children and moms and i don't know what other people you know and some of you have developed your programs, you know, treating uh, athletes, you know, or treating just a regular dental patient who comes in just to have the teeth cleaned, whatever, you know, and depending on our personal bias, you know, everybody has developed their own program, and unfortunately, with that I have to say, it is the programs that are adopted by everybody are, in terms of heavy metal detox, are not necessarily the programs that are reflecting the truth. They are the programs that are promoted by the most charismatic speakers. If the speaker has a lot of charisma, I don't want to drop names here, yeah, that's the program that most of you are ending up using. If somebody has a little bit less credibility because of their credentials or their less penetration into your mental field because they're less charismatic, you're not going to hear them. It's going to wash over you. And so right now, the, the programs that I see that are recommended that people embark on are reflecting the personality of the most charismatic speakers in the field and have nothing to do with the truth. And the charismatic speakers, of course, are the ones that have the most theory behind them. They have kind of done all the reading. You know, I had like a big wake-up call on, on this thing, and I'm happy to tell you this. I was sort of you know, following different teachers, first Dr. Dandra in, in Munich, who's done, probably has the most experience in the world with it. You know, he's done it since the 50s. I've done it now for close to 30 years. I've been with people, and I've been with him so thick and thin, and saw what worked, what didn't work, and developed my own 
sort of approach with that. And then came along Boyd Haley and the whole generation of American chemists, biochemists, and said, well, well, here's that molecule and that molecule, and we need to address it this way. And Boyd had uh, published this wonderful study uh, on EDTA where he showed that sodium EDTA was making complexes with mercury that create these inert substances and may clog up the nervous system and may actually be a bad thing. So he postulated that giving sodium EDTA may actually be a bad thing. So there I was at a conference and speaking, well, you know, I've never really recommended sodium EDTA for heavy metal detox, not because I think it's dangerous, but because it simply never worked. I didn't see the same miracles that I saw with my method for using sodium EDTA. But I used Boyd Haley's argument, and I said, well, because you know, it makes these complexes, and I flashed up the study, and Boyd Haley was in the audience. And at the end, there was a discussion. And I thought, like, you know, Boyd Haley is going to be siding with me and kind of giving this thing. And when Boyd came on the stage, he said, well, we didn't know it was an in vitro study. And I really know, don't know if it has any meaning at all on the human body. <laughs> and he completely let me, let me go, based after he kind of talked, you know. On, on the theory of this for many years and completely let me fall like a, like a dead apple from a tree. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, well, he is now one of the top world chemists, you know, speaking on the amalgam issue, but when push came to shove to actually making a real suggestion of what are we gonna do with the real patient that sits in front of you, he completely dropped it. And yet, Half this country is now following his teachings, you know, so he has, well, we shouldn't use this and shouldn't use that. And since then, he kind of changed his course a little bit and became a big speaker on what people should do. But my suggestion is with this, we need an outcome study. You know, we need this kind of simply, you know, so if we're gonna have other charismatic speakers here uh, the next few days, you know, they're gonna give you their ideas or so. But let's cut through the crap at some point, you know, and do a simple outcome study and see you know, what is happening to people. Like, I, you know, I, one of the things that was promoted, like when I f first came over here 15 years ago, uh, w was very big on treating uh, uh, mercury poisoning with DMPS and DMSA. And I happened to know, like here in our community in Seattle, where I live, one of the most outstanding physicians that we have there was treating a number of children with DMSA for detoxing. And two of these children ended up in my practice because they developed intractable seizure disorders after the DMSA was started. And I was on my conference, I said, listen guys, let's kind of rethink this. Giving DMSA alone at least is not a safe thing. It displaces mercury often from wherever it grabs it in the body into the brain. We need to rethink this thing. You know, DMSA alone is not safe. It at least needs to be combined with other intelligent things. And yet, a couple of years later, everybody gave DMSA and I saw more and more children with it. And it's like, no matter how much I screamed, I said, you know, stop, like, look at your mistakes, look at the things that don't work. We, we can't go this way. And it was very hard to, to bring any rational sort of sense to it. And so I'm just saying, you know, we need some outcome studies on some of this and then we can converge. Right now, it's sort of like the way we're trying to get uh, consistency in the mercury detox field is through expert opinions. You know, whoever has the highest credentials and PhDs behind them and, the, uh, and is the most charismatic speaker, his opinion is valued more than the guy who silently treated, you know, 20, 30,000 people and has seen what works and what doesn't work. And so we can't keep going this way. And eventually the truth, you know, will, will sort of find its way, it, it always does. But we, I think we can speed it up a little bit. Hmm. Um, you spoke about rice and um, uh, I have an interest in rice. Sorry. Speak up, please. Sorry. A little louder, a little louder, yeah. You, you spoke about rice and I have an interest in rice. You know, one of, uh, two years ago you gave a lecture <coughs> and you talked about the longevity of cancer patients being great, greatly increased by teaching them to experience joy. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Well, I, mm -hmm, uh, well, I have to, to argue with you there. I think the wonderful thing that has happened silently on the sidelines is the methods in, psycholog in psychology have become less and less traumatic, less and less invasive, and more and more effective with very light touch. And I think, you know, because of, not because of what Reich did was wrong, but in, he had to create first like a, a morphogenetic field where healing was possible in that way. And the field is becoming more and more light and more and more easy to navigate through and I think it's now people that come in now to learn some psychological healing techniques gets easier and easier. Let's not, let's, let's not go there because I, I want to go somewhere else with it. Can we, uh, we can in the break, you know, we can connect. <laughs> and so, yeah, because there's a whole, whole bunch. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe I want to say uh, one thing here before I show some overheads. Like the main concern I'm having uh, in our time now and the, when you said the word joy that comes on, is an increase, what I'm observing in myself and in society and people around me is an increasing blunting of the senses. Yeah? That the joy isn't as joyful anymore as it used to be. The, the orgasm isn't as high anymore as it used to be. When I go out and smell the flowers, it isn't as intense anymore as it is. Through the effects of the biotoxins in us, Mercury is one of them, heavy metals are some of them, but there is also uh, neurotoxins generated by bacteria in us, and uh, there is the effect of fluoride in the drinking water, which has a huge uh, uh, ameliorating effect on our uh, joy system. A great study shows in England that uh, the, the consuming of uh, fluoridated drinking water calcifies the pineal gland, which in all spiritual traditions is considered the, the connection to, to the divine. Yeah? And they'll be actually putting that in the water to disconnect us from that. Hitler put fluoride in the drinking water to make the Germans docile, so, so they wouldn't so complacent. I see the same here in this country happening you know, with the fluoridation of the drinking water. It's terrible. Just one thing is terrible. You know, there, is, there's, there, there is sort of like there is, I mean, for me, I can say it here, that there is like an evil influence that goes through the minds of people and then makes, uh, you know, makes politicians and industry make certain decisions that actually pen out that where the summation of the effects, the electromagnetic fields, you know, the, the cell phone towers, all that, you know, is a blunting of the senses where, just, where we just don't have our enthusiasm anymore. And we're really trying, with biological dentistry, we're really trying to work against that. And it's really like a, it's a divine task, if you want. It's a spiritual uh, task that we're having at hand. It's like in working against the forces that are trying to make us more blunt, more obedient, more bored. Uh, we're really working against that. We're, we're pro-life in that way. You know? And I think uh, you know, any, anybody who can make a contribution in that and is welcome. You know? and there's a lot of infighting, you know, amongst the academics in our groups. And so sort of, well, I got the right thing here, and I got this study proving this and stuff. There's a lot of infighting now that didn't used to be, didn't used to be here. And I'm just kind of asking all of you, this is not about personal egos and, and achievements and stuff. This is really uh, our work with the core of being this group is about creating a force that leads us back into life affirmative lifestyles and starting you know, with what is in our body and kind of moving out from here and stopping some of the things that are uh, killing us, not as a humanity only, but uh, as the, uh, the whole animal kingdom is threatened right now. You know, we, I'm working together with the Native American tribe up north uh, from Seattle that takes in injured animals you know, from the wild, bears and eagles and all those things. And it is just horrible to hear how, how we're decimating you know, the, uh, the other part of the population on the planet. And it's limited what any, what any single person can do. But doing it from a dental point of view and kind of keeping the earth in mind and kind of spreading out from here 
this has been a wonderful journey and personally rewarding because getting my brain back, you know, when I first detox myself from, from amalgam, and many of you had that experience, is a, almost a spiritual experience, you know, getting your brain back, you know, seeing colors again, smelling again. And uh, I hope many of you who aren't on this journey yet that you join in on it. I'm going to uh, show you just a few overheads. Uh oh. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. So, um, in terms of energetic dentistry, um, just to define that a little bit more, this is a model uh, that I devi developed 15 years ago. So, it really comes out of the Vedic tradition in India. Uh, we consider that the, the physical body is in the center of the energy body, you know, that there is an energetic presence that we have in which the physical body exists. And there is a reciprocal relationship between the physical body and the energy body. It's almost like the physical body is the car, and the energy body is the driver of the car. And we can get sick on all levels, but experience illness usually only in the physical body. But the cause of the illness cannot only be, you know, that the kidney is causing uh, the tooth problem, but it can be uh, in the vertical system that another energy system is out, and the the downfall of that is affecting the physical body. So the physical body is, you know, where the teeth are. That's where our structures, organs, biochemistry, and all that is. And most people deal only with this level. You know, when you're a dentist, you're, you're working mechanically, maybe you're detoxing people, it's also physical body stuff. The next level up, I call the electromagnetic body. That's all of the stuff that Robert Becker talks about. It's the summation of the functions in the nervous system, membranes, uh, light emissions that cells have. Now we know that cells emit sound. You know, from stem cell research, we found this wonderful thing um, that, you know, stem cells get injected intravenously. And then within very few hours, they're attaching, attaching themselves wherever the body is sick, you know, to an ill heart and start growing new heart cells or to an ill brain, growing new brain cells. The question was, how do the cells know where to go? And first they looked at light emissions of cells. Sick cells give off very little light and healthy cells give off infrared light that's stronger. But it wasn't that, it was sound emissions. So we put a microphone in a sick heart and amplified it through some sophisticated equipment and the dying heart cells, it was the most heart-ranging music that I've ever heard. It sounds like a choir of grieving women, you know, that just lost everything. You know, it, says it was heart-ranging to hear that. The German uh, engineer wired that up, and they found out that stem cells hear that sound. They're in the blood, they're circulating around, they hear the sound, and they follow the sound and go to where the grief is, where the pain is, and that's where they attach themselves to. You know, and this is all stuff that happens on this level here. Meridians, chakras, all that belongs here. Neural therapy, acupuncture, uh, some techniques. We do a lot of work with microcurrent, and I wanted to talk really about lymph drainage. Lymph drainage is achieved through two methods. One, you know, the whole, every tooth in the pulp has a lymph channel. That's the one thing most dentists have overlooked. Most teeth that are getting sick are getting sick because the lymph channel isn't draining the tooth properly. When we can drain the tooth properly, the swelling goes away, the edema, there's more blood going in, more nutrients. Teeth can heal. It's a new concept I like to convey to the dentist. There is a large portion of teeth that can heal from the inside out, truly heal. That is something not discovered within dentistry, <laughs> but outside dentistry by a lot of neurobiological researchers. And lymph drainage seems to be at the core of it. There's two simple principles. It belongs on the second level. One, lymph channels are plugged up by macromolecules, by proteins that are baked together. And the first technique that you need to use is a technique that breaks them apart. It's done through microcurrent, through electromagnetics, infrared laser. All those things break molecules apart and make them smaller. And the second technique is by dilating the lymph channel. Lymph channels have smooth muscle outside. They can be narrow and constricted, and they can be wide. And again, microcurrent or procaine injections can be used to, to achieve that. 
Andriana, where are you? Andriana, my nurse. Uh, she, I, and uh, another partner that we have developed lymph drainage techniques for the jaw, which are phenomenal in restoring teeth and healing cavitations. So with some simple instruments applying uh, uh, different, different sorts of electromagnetic energy to the jawbone, to the teeth, we can heal cavitations to a large degree, non-invasively now. We have that down. We worked on it for 12 years. We have that down now. And I probably won't have time. I want to just do my demonstration in a minute. So, the intraosseous neural therapy. Yeah, the intraosseous neural therapy is a technique that Ara developed, or really Ara and I developed uh, many years back. Now, it's uh, it used to be the stabi dent equipment. Then, what's the new one called? Uh, where you can leave the needle in. X tip. X tip the x uh, thing, where I already developed that idea and then we ran with it. When a tooth is ailing or there's a cavitation with unhealthy metabolic products in it, we drill a little hole in the jawbone and then either drain the fluid out that's in there or we install healing remedies. First healing remedies, most important one is procaine. Uh, from the heal remedies, the one that Ara turned me on is wonderful, is calmia uh, or a little bit of tromil, a lot of calmia. Um, I use now exclusively ozone. Ozone has been absolutely fantastic in healing the jawbone and healing many other things. We do almost all our injections now. We learned that at, uh, at your meeting in, in Nevada from Schellenberger, you know, the ozone injection has been phenomenal. Like, we do all the jaw joint injections. We put uh, a cc of ozone in there. And usually with two, three injections, most jaw joints are completely restored to health. We do injections in the gums with ozone that restores uh, always a periodontal disease very, very quickly within 10 days or so. And we do the stabidan procedure by putting ozone inside the jawbone, eliminating microorganisms that we don't even know who they are yet. Yeah? We don't know their names. And I don't give them, I know they're anaerobic. And I know that the moment I try to take them out of the jawbone and there's a little bit air exposing them, they disappear. And they have been very hard, they have been an enigma to find. But I know just by putting a little ozone in there, I can knock them out. And people have major, major, major health recoveries with that. It's a procedure can be done in any MD's office, in any dental office. And how many of you are using it here? You know, so just a handful of people. And it's sad because it was probably five, six, seven years ago that we first lectured on it. And um, we were thinking, we knew then that we had a really major, major tool that we have invented or reinvented or applied to our technique. But very few people have been using it. People rather operate than put a needle in there with a little medicine. I don't know why that is. You know, it's the same in Germany, same experience. It's not an American privilege sometimes to be slow or to, you know, when things are too simple, it does wash over you. Yeah, but ask Ara about it in the break if you, if you feel compelled to do so. It hurts. It, it hurts, yeah. No, no. No, no. You put, yeah, what well we do, we combine it with, with several other techniques. We have a magnetic field where we can uh, open or close the blood supply to an area. So I use that in combination with that. We inject the CC of procaine in there, wait a moment. Then we inject the procaine. Uh, we do the injection every day for three days in a row in the jawbone. And we place a, uh, the south pole of a magnetic field on the area which closes the blood supply. That means you put the ozone in and lock it in the area. That's an important part of it. But let's not go into details here because it's sort of like everybody has their own, own way of doing it. But our experience was very positive. You know, and maybe different patients, maybe it's you know, because we do the, the dental work as a last step you know, after cleaning up the patient psychologically in other ways. And then it often just takes a little extra extra thing at the end. Yeah. I'm talking about the diet drainage. Um, how do you evaluate um, some of the German homeopathics like the myosod or lymph diural or so forth that they use? Yeah, uh, the, the German homeopathic, the injectable homeopathics overall uh, 
with the current electromagnetic environment, I'm observing that homeopathy now is far less effective than it was even 10 years ago. It's going down linear. You know, it's very clear to me. You know, those of you who have been around 30 years ago when I started with homeopathy, it was like you had a dental problem, you inject half a vial of lymphomyosote, you could walk away from the patient, you knew you never had to worry about that tooth again. Those times have changed. You know, it's not like that. And so we're using now much stronger energies, uh, knowing that the electromagnetic environment we exist in is a major, major factor in constricting blood vessels, not allowing signals from cell to cell to pass. And so we have to override that. And so we use very strong electromagnetic microcurrent, magnetic fields, and, and so forth. Yeah, yeah. It was a death. There was a strange um, high number of deaths, like also in my surveillance amongst patients, their relatives, or so. There was a high death rate in the last month. Um, so I want to go up here. So the next level up is the mental body. This is where our beliefs, attitudes, and thoughts are. That's a home of psychotherapy. Any unresolved issue here will have a deep and penetrating effect on the low levels. And then there is the fourth level, and sort of where the more woo woo stuff is you know, nightmares, uh, spirit procession. Uh, this is where all the unresolved family conflicts are. You know, if your grandfather, uh, you know, was in the Ku Klux Klan um, and was responsible for the death of several people, you're probably going to have some children now that are suicidal, using drugs, and killing themselves. You know, this sort of would be an outcome of that on this generation. But also on a smaller level, it means teeth commit suicide. Yeah, I look at a very metaphorical, yeah, so something, com something, a crime was committed up here in order to balance it, somebody is self-sacrificing. At first it could be just a body part, and the teeth are the densest part in our body, and so they're always kind of the, the fall guy, that's where all the streams of consciousness come together. And so we very often, in order to heal a dental pain, I go up here, look in the family, deal with that, and then very often the next day the toothache is gone, and then, you know, we check the x-ray six weeks later, and the bone is filling in again, you know, where there was a cavitation before. It is like magic, but it isn't. Yeah, so we have these five levels, and we try to find out where the problem is. We go up there, resolve it, and work the system up and down. Um, one thing where that applies to is the heavy metal issue. You know, where does it all fit together? Um, when we see a patient, they come in uh, with a symptom. In general, most of us old-timers here are in agreement now that most symptoms are caused by infectious microorganisms. Yeah, we, we know that Lyme disease is rampant. I did a, a series of uh, 10 patients in my last round of seeing patients in January where uh, in 10 consecutive patients I made the diagnosis of Lyme disease and now this time decided to confirm or disconfirm the diagnosis with lab work to see how accurate I was and did the Western blot on those 10 patients, all of them came back highly positive. Not only two bands positive, but the, the least bands I saw was four bands positive, in both IgG and IgM. So first of all, I know that my muscle testing has gotten much more accurate lately. Secondly, Lyme disease is much more rampant. Andy Landerman turned us on to the idea last year that the first molar when it goes, it's usually Lyme disease, and that was such a valuable pearl, you know. So all we do now, like we go in the mouth, we tap on the first molar, the arm goes weak, we put a few things on there to see if it balances it. Um, we also turn us on to the herb teasel, which was a phenomenal discovery for most of us, that an herbal supplement can make a huge difference on the dental component of Lyme disease. Your Lyme disease Usually, it first appears in this area in terms of the symptoms, and that's the last area where it disappears from when you treat it. <laughs> Just a little tip you know, for some of the old timers here. But this is sort of a model I developed based on my observations that you have a symptom, let's say you have chronic headaches. When you really look and anatomically look in the endothelium of the, of the blood vessels, 
Uh, you find nanobacter in there. You find chlamydia pneumonia. You find that the actual cause of it ultimately is an infection. Infections settle in the body in areas that are contaminated with toxic metals or other environmental pollutants. The metals have a leading role here. And metals settle in areas in the body that are compromised through unresolved psycho-emotional conflicts. This is pretty much my system of working up patients. I look just selectively at those three issues. Yeah? No matter if you come to me with an ingrown toenail or with terminal cancer, I look at those three issues. To restrict myself, you know, having boundaries around what you do is very wonderful. I wanted to show one little tool um, that we've been using. This is a uh, machine used in Germany. It's a ozone generator that generates, uh, well, as we probably said, active gases out of room air. It burns away certain gases through an electronic filter, uh, selects, makes 5% ozone together with certain nitrogen compounds. And we're using that in two orifices in the body. We use it in oral cavity and in the sinuses as our main treatment now for sinusitis and for uh, gum disease, just by blowing it in and holding it in the mouth for 10 minutes every day. And then we use it rectally. You know, we use a long bladder catheter. We put it up uh, the colon. And that has been absolutely phenomenal. And before I go on and do a demo, the, the, demo, the last thing I want to share with you um, is, a, is a very simple idea, <laughs> but it is so funny that it's been overlooked. Um, the gut in a normal person contains 8 to 12 pounds of living microorganisms, yeah? 8 to 12 pounds. The most infected mouth that you can imagine you know, may contain a quarter of a gram of microorganisms at most. And there's plenty of research that shows that every single bug you have in the mouth has a huge reservoir in the colon and the small intestine. That means for every bug that you have here, you have the identical bug in the colon a million times more. And uh, now this is something I learned when Ed Arana and I were doing some research on Adolf Hitler. You know, Ed has uh, Adolf Hitler's x-ray, dental x-ray. And um, he had lots of root canals, jaw infections. I was clear why the guy went crazy. Um, but one of the things historically that's known about him is that he had, you know, was losing his teeth. <laughs> And uh, the physicians treating him were losing their lives because they weren't getting him better. <laughs> he was a, I mean, he was a horrible <laughs> dictator. I mean, like that makes Saddam Hussein like a pussy cat. Um, and what the the last physician that actually made it, that lived through it to tell the story, was a guy who put him on healthy bowel flora, kind of <laughs> acknowledging the fact, you know, so we need to treat the reservoir of these bugs, not the bugs, and. Uh, then some Germans in the 50s and 60s went after that and saw if they could treat gum disease by treating the bugs in the colon. And we tried to do that, and it's very hard. It takes a lot of money to put enough healthy bowel bacteria in here in order to change this. But all the bugs that we're worried about are anaerobes. And so uh, this physician in Germany had the idea of just blowing some ozone up there to uh, decrease the number of air, uh, anaerobes and facilitate the growth of aerobes. And I can tell you how magical that was for us. We have the machine now built uh, in, in America, and we have some uh, modifications of it. We can put blue light into the gas. We can actually activate the gas with color. We're putting blue light in it. We can cool down any infection in the jaw, uh, usually within 10 minutes or so. It's been a great advance. Uh, anyway, Andy can, can tell you about it at the thing. Let's do a quick demo yeah, of, do you mind coming, Holly? And um, I want to show you how our energetic testing looks like, uh, what we're doing with it. Um, would somebody turn up the light or open the doors, uh, whatever we can do? For, actually, for our testing, we need some light. Hi, Holly. Hi, <laughs> right. So what is this? This is a dental x-ray? Yeah. OK, so Holly, I met like a year ago or so. She lives in this neighborhood. Hi. And uh, she had chronic fatigue and all those things. And we 
worked with her with the with the fillings. She does have a couple of root canals. She has the usual sort of California mouth, we call it. <laughs> um, she does have a great smile. She's a fantastic musician. Um, Holly, come here. We have to lie down. This is our exam table here for now. Oh, we wanted, oh, hang on. We want to bring the table over there, yeah. didn't we? So just, uh, you know, since it's on energy medicine in dentistry, I want to show you how the testing works when we do it. Come lie down here. Mm -hmm, head here. Andy, do you have your machine with you? Andy Landerman? You don't? Okay. Well, anyway, Andy, uh, Andy, show who you are. Yeah, Andy is in Santa Rosa, and Andy is our one of our greatest grandfathers, really, in this country of the bioenergetic testing using EAV and uh, has been really like a mentor of mine at one stage of my evolution. And he's been very closely uh, linked to all to the German teachers and really carries, carries that, incarnates that, uh, the teaching that is actually getting lost in Germany right now to a certain degree. Okay, now we need the, the plunks. I want to show you a few advances that we had made in the last few years. Uh, first of all, we acknowledging now we're not shy anymore. We, we don't do any testing direct on the body anymore. We acknowledge that our testing is purely energetic and we don't need to pretend to the patient that this has to do anything with the physical body. So we use uh, special crystal glass plates that have a high uh, uh, perfect crystal structure in it um, that amplifies any, any substance I put on here. The effect of it is much amplified in the energy field and the body next to it behaves as if the substance is in the body. So it allowed us to much better predict outcome than any other method that we had before. Then secondly, we use a polarization filter. Uh, the research by Dr. Pop in Germany showed that uh, any living thing is giving off a very, very strictly, perfectly polarized field. And the body field of infrared light that comes of our body goes out in this plane. Those who know of a polarized light know what that means. Those others, we're not going to go there. And if the body becomes sick, the field doesn't come out this way. It comes out at an off angle. Yeah? If I have a sick liver, the field doesn't come out. The light doesn't come out this way. It comes out at an off angle or in a chaotic way. And with the direct resonance phenomenon by Omura, we can measure this. Yeah? If I hold the pole filter over her system in the perfect direction, this is a linear polarization filter where the light should come out. A strong arm will go weak. And if the light is not coming out perfectly, we can measure the degree by which it's coming out imperfect. It's a huge advance in our testing. It can be applied to EIV or in, in muscle testing. I'll show you how that goes. And you just kind of uh, watch us here. So we test always indirectly. Indirect testing is more reliable than direct testing good study out on that. I align the pull filter according to the long axis of her body. And she is blocked. She's not opening up at the perfect angle. So now I tweak it like 10 degrees every time. And we see that she's not far off. She's about 10 degrees off the perfect degree. So our first step is to find out what will it take to make her perfect. So we do that now by bringing in things into her energy field that will correct the angle that the light is coming out with. And <coughs> the first thing I'm going to check is a dental x-ray. Let's get the other glass plate. She had, she had all her amalgams removed recently s since I've seen her. And so first of all, I want to check, is there anything in the dental x-ray? <coughs> if I bring that into her field, that changes the reading. There's nothing. So now the next thing, we check out the heavy metal detox substances. Just kind of put a few of them on there. We have a small? Maybe. Maybe. I'm not uh, against bracelets or, or things, but we're testing them in the course of this. 
Now we see that now, uh, oh yeah, by the way, these two glass things communicate over distance with each other. Yeah, the Germans had the sender receiver unit, it was battery driven and cost 2,000 bucks. Now we discover there's a simple light principle where two light bodies, if the identical materials, resonate with each other. So we can broadcast information over last distances without battery. So if the light goes out, <laughs> it was funny, being yesterday in Seattle Times paper that somebody had like put like a half page ad against the, the Gulf War in there and said, if, you know, if uh, in New York, if there would be no petroleum uh, in New York, that within two days everybody would die. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like that. I mean, we humans are much more inventive than that, you know, and creative than that, and especially in New York, you know, like, I mean, like, I don't think a single person would die if there would be no gasoline in New York. You know, they, they find a way, you know. And uh, anyway, the, we'd be quite happy if the lights go out because our system is now completely without electricity or anything. Okay, it's not that one. So she's checking now single detox agents that, uh, and here's one that's testing very nicely, what is it? PCA. PCA. A PCA is a liquid extract of chlorella and cilantro uh, that's used as an oral spray, so we're going to recommend that to you. Uh, but check the other options, so, so we go through all of them. So we simply kind of look at what is the right thing for her. We could check DMSA, alpha lipoic acid, vitamin C, you know, all the, the common things that we do uh, to detox patients and come up with the things that are the main winners for her. And rather than having to establish a detox program with a thousand things, you can usually have you know, two or three things that work at this time for this patient. Okay. So here's a, a product uh, called Porphyrazan. Do you check uh, <coughs> chlorella and cilantro? We usually check a few things, chlorella, cilantro, DMSA, DMPS, EDTA, all the hyped up things you know, that are out there. And we're just getting a take, you know, and some people go in the direction of all the self hydral binding things and the other ones go in the direction of all the different EDTA and other ones in the direction of, oh, this is really strong, what is that? Chlorella. Oh, chlorella. Uh, you've, how much chlorella are you taking currently? Um, let's see, uh, eight tablets to be done. Okay, okay, so it's, it's a good one for you. We're just going to add in some PCA for you. So leave that on. So now we go to the next step. It's called neurogenic switching, checking for chaos in the nervous system. This is okay, you know, do the other hand. It's okay, good. Open your hand, turn your head this way, your eyes the other way, and go this way, your eyes this way. Okay, so she has a, a condition, psychological condition, we call it psychological reversal. What are these symptoms right now? Like, uh, oh, for me, no, the, oh, my mouth is really, really sensitive to Mouth hot is and sensitive cold. to hot and cold. Everything, nerves are sh Okay, shallow. how's your energy level? Okay. Okay. Close your eyes and just repeat after me. Okay. I want to be healthy. Eyes I closed. Eyes closed. I want to be healthy. I want to be completely healthy. I want to be completely healthy. I'm worthy to be completely healthy. I'm worthy to be completely healthy. Let me see there's a blockage that comes up when she says that I'm worthy to be completely healthy. You know, it usually means there's something in the limbic system, a set of issues that aren't resolved, that are tweaking, you know, your conscious mind of course wants to be healthy, but there's something that's tweaking the signal and arrives in the body the opposite way. It's called psychological reversal. So the way we're dealing with that is you tap on the outside of the hand. Mm -hmm. Do that now. Is that a small intestine, the meridian? Oh, Do a waltz no. rhythm. One, two, three, one, two, three. All, use the index finger also with it. Oh, okay. all, all fingers. Okay. And close your eyes and kind of say, I'm worthy to be completely healthy. I'm worthy to be completely healthy. Four times. Yeah. Yeah. So this is psychological reverse. To be found by doing this, we get about 100% more results than before we did this. It's a very, very important 
thing. If there's something in the subconscious that's not congruent with wanting to get well, you can run the walls and it won't happen. And this is Callahan's technique. It works wonderful. Andy? Is there any reason to do uh, one side versus the other, or do you find the same? No, the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you say it one more time? I'm worthy to be completely healthy. I'm worthy to be completely healthy. Okay. <laughs> no, it doesn't block, block her when she says it. Keep her eyes closed. It is safe for me to be completely healthy. It is safe for me to be completely healthy. Okay. That's one that's congruent. I'm worthy to be pain free. I am worthy to be pain free. I'm worthy to have all my energy. I am worthy to have all my energy. Okay, do that one also. So for demonstration I'm not gonna go any further, but we spend often like half an hour on this and then write these sentences that are blocking her down and I give it to her as a prescription. Four times a day, she'll have to do that for six weeks. And it's been the most healing thing we've done to people. Half the jaw problems at least disappear with this. Half the facial pain disappears. With this, with no other interventions, not touching the patient, just doing this. Okay, let's, let's check uh, the, the head movement. Go this way, I see other way. Okay, great. No, it's good. So now we are uh, checking if me touching her in different places is bringing the field back out of its alignment. Yeah, and checking the emotional heart area is. And uh, testing the left kidney is. And so since you just had the amalgams removed, we want to check up. Uh, some other detox agents. Let's just bring the PCA back in. See if that, that is doing the trick. So left kidney, we could check now what's blocking it. I don't want to go too far with this, but that opens the heart up and the kidney. Okay, so then there's another level of the testing without the polarization filter. The arm is strong. Now I do what most EAV or muscle testing people would do. I check the different organs and see if there's anything left. And we see here the spleen area is still testing. And I'm suspicious. I want to check out the dental x-ray. Is there any, any stuff in the dental x-ray that is compromising her spleen? And there is. You know, the spleen is you know, the, it's a filter. It's like a a filter system that takes the blood and filters out all the bad stuff. If you have root canal fillings, uh, there's a daily amount of neurotoxins coming from that. And there's a relationship I can now with the, with the singer find out on the x-ray directly where is the resonance that has to do with the spleen dysfunction. Yeah, and it is a root canal filled tooth on the lower on the lower right is causing the trouble. Yeah? And I'm done. Yeah, I know that this is where the area is. And now I would do the topaz test on her, uh, the ALT testing, yeah, that hopefully all of you are doing you know, with the Boyd Haley's little paper stick and then sticking it in a solution, see what color it turns, and you find out how toxic is the tooth. Yeah? I hope that all of you are doing it. It's a great test. It's been a great predictor of good outcome. If it's bad, we take the tooth out, the patient has a major improvement. If the tooth is not bad and you take it out, nothing much happens to the patient. Yeah, so it's been a great test. And the second test uh, uh, that we're doing, of course, you know, if it wouldn't be a root canal, I would do vitality testing on it. I do it with an ice cube to see how long does it taste, take, you know, for the patient to feel this area. And we could now do other so energetic testings on that tooth, which, which we'll do in private later. Yeah. Thanks, Holly. That's, that's, that was my little demonstration. I know my time must be way up. Um, this was just a little demonstration to show you how we sort of, you know, we take a patient, we know a few things about them, we do our testing, we see where the hang-ups, uh, we find solutions out of the whole huge universe of possible solutions. We focus in on the things that are relevant to the patient's life, like she just had the fillings taken out, therefore we want to check uh, the organs of excretion, we want to check uh, things that are in relationship to that, so I'm concentrating on using uh, potential heavy metal detox agents, binding agents, 
uh, simulating agents. Um, and I use a few things I know about psychology. And I can go at any place, I can go as deep as I want to go. Um, one last thing, maybe to the energetics of heavy metal detox, because uh, my last chance to say it, I know I'm over time, but I need to say this. Um, there's two things to consider when you detox a patient. One is the many body compartments that mercury and other metals can be in. And you can shift it from one compartment to another. And the idea of heavy metal detox is we take the metals and you first clean up the excretory organs. That means you first want to give an agent that cleans up the kidneys and the gut and the lung. You first get the exit routes free. That is so misunderstood. The best agent, I have to say, to clean out the kidneys in the literature is IV DMPS. It's an early drug. It should be used only once or twice early on to get the kidneys free. Then the next body compartment that comes is the connective tissue. Uh, and then the third one is the intracellular compartment. And most people do this all wrong. They start with the intracellular and overloading the already stuffed up detox pathways too much. You want to start from the bottom and work your way up. Yeah? If it's, it's a toilet that's plugged up, you don't want to put more poop in before clearing the pipe. That simple principle seems to be difficult for many people to grasp. You have to keep that in mind. That's one consideration. The other consideration is that what ionic form is mercury in? There's only three forms. There's HG0, metallic mercury, HG1+, plus, and HG2+. Plus. And the more pluses are behind the mercury, the more toxic it is wherever it is in the body. Very simple. And so what we want to do is we want to uh, reduce the oxidative status of mercury and make it less toxic. Vitamin C is great for that. Uh, you know, it, it adds an electron to things as it gets in contact with them. It may not be getting into the intracellular compartment enough. Uh, in some people, alpha lipoic acid is great um, to open the door and to reconstitute the intracellular component of mercury to make it into a lesser oxidized form. We use physics. We use microcurrent and we use light. There's a thing called the Fraunhofer lines. It's, uh, you know, when you heat up mercury, it gives off certain light emissions. And the major emission is in the yellow-green spectrum. And we can use a mercury vapor lamp, shine on the head of a patient, and within seconds, the HG2 plus is transformed to HG1 plus or HG0 and can now be grabbed with vitamin C and simple compounds. And so what we do very often, mercury vapor lamp for half an hour while they're on the IV vitamin C, and the stuff comes out like nothing we've seen before. That was the last thing I wanted to say, this energetic aspects of heavy metal detox that I want you to start thinking about. I'm not giving you any tools today. I'm just kind of trying to open your mind up a little bit. You know, there is some wonderful things out there um, that are coming our way other than biochemistry. Biochemistry is boring. Um, much of it is already discovered. Uh, the physics of it all is new and exciting and very, very effective. Thank you very much. We have a break now, do we? Yes. We have a break now, guys. Yeah, how long could you listen to Dietrich speak about this stuff? It's, it's amazing. Uh, thank you. Very, very much. The problem is no charisma, and he can't, he can't speak to anybody. He can't really get to you. You know, he doesn't have anything to say we really want to hear. Uh, which, uh, of course, is not any truth. Thank you, Deacon, very much. There's a break now. Let's come back in uh, 20, 25 minutes, and uh, we'll carry on. Thank you. Thank you.